God's word, faithfully preached, is his comprehensive equipment for changing lives, delivering them from the shackles of sin, the flesh, and the world, and transforming them into useful vessels through whom Jesus can pour out his blessings. Living Seed invites you to a feast of the truth as God's servant brings to us the word of life. This is not a teaching about ministry gifts in the body of Christ. But this is particularly necessary because we can be growing the church if we do not understand the implements by which God has ordained that his church will grow. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 simply puts, it says, the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to bring profit to all. Do you understand? Every gift that God has allowed to manifest in you and every one of you have a manifestation of the spirit. As soon as a child of God is born again, and I spoke about the seal of the Holy Ghost. Do you remember I spoke about that? That, you know, they knew that once a man is born again, he has repented. We must not wait before we confront him with the power of the Holy Spirit because it is the Holy Spirit that seals him and gives him what it takes for him to take his place in the body. So the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which we have generally neglected in our own ministry, was the seal that's supposed to position each member within the circumference of their grace so that they can be functional in the body of Christ. It is not for sure. It is so that each man will be able to locate his own divine space in the body as to function. So, every one of us is giving the manifestation of the spirit to profit with all. You are to bring profit to all of us through your gifts. So may I say that a man that is not operating within his gift, he doesn't have anything to profit us. You will not be profitable to God you will not be profitable to the brethren. You will not be profitable to the church when you are not engaging your own gifts which grace has brought to you. Are we together? So, brothers, I would like to say to you that each one of you in ministry, we must locate where is your space grace? Did you see that I've added, I put one word so as to make it clear. Your space grace. Eh? The grace, the space of your grace. The dimension of it, the proportion of it, the measure of it. And the gifts with which you are to profit the ministry, to profit the church, to profit the brethren. I know years ago what God had endowed me with as my contribution to the body of Christ. I know it. And once I discovered it, I knew that, look, if I'm going to be useful to God, if I'm going to be useful to the brethren, if my life is going to bless anybody at all, I must operate within that. 
I have refused that anybody takes me out of my great space. I refuse. I don't want to be a poor adaptation of another man. I am satisfied to be who God wants me to be. And I have realized that you will only be known within your space grace. So what is it that is very important? It is that you will recognize that what God had given you as gifts is also your implement to bring profit to the people of God. You will only be profitable to us when you are operating with your endowment. Do you hear me? So the first thing as ministers of the gospel is not about an overall. No, forget that. Stop that ambition. Stop it. You will only make yourself useless. Locate your grace space. Locate the divine enablement, the gifts that the Spirit of God has laid on your life according to the measure of the grace and proportion of faith that God has dealt with you. And can you labor in it? So I hear Paul say, I labor more than they all, yet not I, but the grace that was given to me. So you see, everything you hear that Paul did, are you understanding? He did it where? Within his own great space. So you see, he will keep challenging people. He challenged the Corinthians and said, I beseech you not to receive the grace of God. How? In vain. He told Timothy, do you know he told Timothy? He said, my son Timothy, be strong in what? In the grace. You see, you will not be strong outside your grace. No matter how you struggle, of course I know, outside the grace of God, you are using the flesh. And the stronger you are in the flesh, the more an abomination you are to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So how can I, as an individual, how can I bring growth to the work of God? It is as I grow in my grace. Pastors, sometimes I don't like to call you pastors because that puts a blanket on your head that makes you operate some time outside your grace. But you will think it's an insult if I call you brother. If I call you sister. So that nothing is particularly pushing you to be who you are not. So that without any, any title that is forcing you to be what you are not, you should have been free to navigate your way into your own grace. Praise the Lord. So if God is going to help you, to be a blessing to the body of Christ. The gifts that God has placed on you is also your only implement 
of bringing profit. So Paul was telling Timothy, let's see what he says to Timothy. Look at it. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, he was telling Timothy, this charge I commit unto you, son, Timothy, according to what? According to what? The prophecies which went before on you, that you by them might war a good warfare. You see, what God pronounces as your space grace is what he gives you to wage a good warfare. It took me space of time to understand that what God gives me is what he expects me to do my battle with. Eh? What God has endowed me with is what he was expecting me to wage my own warfare with. And that is what will give me all the victory that I will ever need in ministry. So to be a man who grows in God and who grows in the work of God, you must deliberately, deliberately recognize the limit of your grace and what it is God has given you and you must employ it. It is as you employ it fully that the overall work will be growing. Sometimes you know from, the, from where we come from, from the work that God has given us to do, what people think, they think I'm the one who will grow the work. No. Mm -mm. I'm only contributing my own grace space. And I am not disturbed when another brother or another sister that God is bringing to the team is operating within his own grace. That is what will make the work to grow. To put your leg on another person's grace. Because you think if he operates within his own grace, he will be a threat to you or he will overshadow you. You are a troubler of Israel. You are troubling the work of God. But you know something makes you say, no, 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 no. Mm -mm, mm -mm. If, if I allow them to operate within their grace now, I will be overshadowed. No. Honestly speaking, they can only grow in their grace. They don't overtake my grace. And I need them to grow in their grace. Are you understanding? For God's work to grow. And that's when I will receive profit because what they are carrying is for my profit. But you know, we all need humility to stay within our grace and to allow others to exercise their grace and never to feel threatened. I never to, to look as if, ah, they are taking my space. Nobody takes my space. I can't take their space. They can't take mine. So I'm always begging God, Lord, you know there are things that God will show me to do. God will show me that concerning this uh, peace house or the living seed team should do the following things. And I look at God, I say, but you know, that is outside my grace space. 
Yes. I said, God, that's not within my grace space. I don't know how to do that. But you want us to do it? Say, yes. It means there is someone that is either in the team that you have endowed with that grace or you are going to bring. So sometimes I'm kneeling down and say, Lord, send someone to come and do this. You see, when that person steps in, he takes it over because that is where he is endowed to operate. He may even outshine me because in that area, he has grace. I will be a poor adaptation if I'm trying to do it. So when it comes to the area of his grace, he's our leader. So what do we do? We submit to his grace. So the scripture says, submitting one to another in the fear of God. But you see, unless you take time to study the Bible, you are always thinking of hierarchy. You are always thinking of one overall man to whom everybody must listen. But you don't understand that mm -mm, there's no such a man. There's only one man like that, and it's Jesus Christ, who is the head of us all. And why is he the head of us all? Out of his own grace have we all received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. It is only Jesus, are you hearing me, that knows how to do everything that any of you is enabled to do. That's why he is the Lord. That's why he is the head. The government of the church is on his shoulder, not on any of us. But that that I'm saying to you now is an offense to the flesh. The flesh cannot hear that I'm saying that none of us is in charge. But the truth is that he is the Lord. He is the head. It is out of his fullness all of us have received. And for church to grow well, we need to recognize that and submit to that leadership and actually wait for it to happen. God could tell me because he has put me maybe as a leader in order to help others to locate their grace. may tell me what to do. But I must know that he's only telling me for information so that I could look for those who have grace to do it. And as when God has not sent someone who has grace to do something, that thing must wait. There's no need to enter into anything. It's not compulsory to do everything. Struggling to do everything because you are competing with someone else will confuse you. I think I should go from here. So what have I said? The prophecies that went on over you, the, 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 the word of endowment that God places on your life is what he has given you by which you can wage a good warfare in your life and in your ministry. And I want God to help us that as we are living here, some of you that have put aside your implement, some of you that have laid aside your grace, some of you that are, that are not exercising the grace of God in your life to the limit to which you can exercise it, you are robbing us. The profit you need to bring to the purpose of God, you have not allowed it. Hallelujah. Look at what he said to Timothy in chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse 14. 
What did it say in verse 14? Neglect not the gift that is in you which was given you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of precipitary. Meditate upon these things. Give yourself only to them that what may appear to all. That what? That your profiting. You will only be profitable and your profiting will appear to all only when you engage the gift of God in your life. How many of you have neglected the gift of God in your life and you are struggling to operate where you are not gifted? You are doing a disservice to the church. Doing a disservice to the church. You are robbing the, the entire work of the profit that God intends us to have through your life. Praise the Lord. Are we together to that point? Now look at him telling Timothy in 2 Timothy again. Follow me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Can you see what it says in verse 6? Wherefore I put you in remembrance. That you do what? Do what? Stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. Because God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power, of love and of what? A sound mind. Your gift that God places on you is your basic capital for doing kingdom business. Are you getting me? Unless you will allow it, you cannot grow. You cannot build the body. We can only build the body and that now with this, I will go back. I will go with you now. Can I go back with you now to Ephesians that we are reading? Can we return to Ephesians? Can we return to Ephesians? <laughs> Let's go back to Ephesians. Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, if you have understood that every one of us is giving grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And that these gifts that he gives to us, they are his resurrection gifts. It was because he descended and ascended. We have these gifts, and I want you to know that these gifts, please listen to me, it's very important now, that these gifts that God has given us is far, far superior to our natural talents. They are no, I'm not just talking of your talents. Let me inform you that every human being has talents. But the gifts of the spirit, they are superior to your talents. Honestly speaking, let me tell you, they will incorporate your talents. Gifts of the Spirit comes into your life. All that you think was your natural talent, they will be subsumed within the gift. So, the gift of the Holy Ghost working in your life to bring profit to the body of Christ engages, employs all your natural talents, but now they have become sanctified and subsumed in the Spirit. Please take note. Some of you have natural talent of singing. Eh? Now, when that natural talent of singing has not yet been baptized in the Holy Ghost, it cannot build the church. 
it can only bring in the contamination of the flesh. So, if the Holy Spirit now are to give you the spiritual gifts may be of exhortation, the Holy Ghost may now employ your singing talent. Are you understanding now? To bring about the expression of the gift of exhortation. Do you get what I'm talking about? There are some of us that God, the gift he has given you to build the church, to bring the profit to the church is teaching. Are you understanding? But the natural talent you have is singing. Are you understanding now? So the Holy Ghost may decide to express your gift of teaching through singing, through songs. So you will see such a man when he composes songs. His songs actually are teaching. But the talent on their own, the talent of singing, is totally limited in bringing profit to the body of Christ until it has been enveloped by the gift of the Spirit according to the measure of grace. Do you understand that now? Now, do you know that there are some people who are naturally talented teachers? That does not mean they will be useful to the church until the Holy Spirit has endued them with the, the gift of the Spirit and in the area of teaching. That's when their talent of teaching can be of blessing. Do you understand that now? That's why natural teachers don't necessarily become spiritual teachers. And so the fact that somebody went to teacher training college to learn all the principles of education does not make him a spiritual teacher in the church. Because he doesn't have the, the anointing that gives him grace to be able to bring a spiritual work. So unfortunately, do you know what we have done? Those that have gone for teacher training, they are the ones you now put as Sunday school teachers. So they come in, they are teaching naturally. You cannot build the church. Do you, do you understand that now? So you see, what God uses to build his church must originate from the Holy Ghost. It doesn't come from the natural. But because God is the creator of all things, he could now subsume the natural things and bring it only as tools for the gift of the Spirit to operate. Do you understand that now? So that's why as you get into the, into the New Testament, what you are going to be engaged with is the Holy Spirit, is the gift of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit. You will notice that they were never talking about talents. So this night, even if you have talent of speaking, you are an orator, that does not mean you will bring correct biblical utterance. That oratory speaking 
has to be subsumed. In fact, honestly, we don't need orators. What we needed is utterance of the Holy Spirit. You know the reason is that when you are an orator, it's a natural thing. It's the flesh. The natural creates words. If you ever met orators, they speak effortlessly. You don't know where they are crafting words from. And that is their pride. <laughs> That's their problem. They can't wait for the Holy Spirit to give them words because they already have too much words. So when you see a pastor on the pulpit who is just an orator, sometimes it depends on that. So he comes on the pulpit and he's just speaking. He speaks, people will laugh, but there will be no power to convict them because he's not spiritual. It's natural. So people that used to be orators, before God could use them, he changed them to stammerers first. <laughs> Do you know that Moses was a great orator? Before God could use him, he became a stammerer. So that he will not be able to just speak words. He would depend on the Holy Ghost to release words to preach. So my brother, are you just on the pulpit with the natural talent? Somehow, the way you are brought up, you have the natural talent of fiction. You know, some of you, you can create story from nowhere. <laughs> eh? You can create stories that never existed and people will, it will look as if it has happened. You may think that that is going to be useful to the kingdom of God. No. It's the flesh. It's the flesh. And it has to be subsumed. It has to be, in fact, it has to be buried. It has to die so that the spirit of God can come. Now, if the Holy Ghost now want to quicken your imaginative ability, it will then be the Holy Spirit using it. Do you get me? So, the question you must be asking is, am I operating within the grace and the endowment of the Holy Spirit or am I using the natural? Do you know that some of you because you went to read administration, you have read principles of management and administration in the secular university. You automatically think that church also can be administered just as you have learned the worldly principles of administration. So you bring that into the work of God. Not knowing that actually there is administration that is a spiritual gifting. Not a natural learning. Do you understand it now? So you now come in you now want to administer the church according to the civil service rules. You are bringing a contamination to the work. Somebody will say, does it mean we should then not use all the things we learned in the world? Let me tell you, where can we use it? Only after it has died. And it has been baptized into the spirit. And when it is now the Holy Ghost that is resurrecting it and activating it and using it. And when the Holy Ghost uses it, listen, 
what the Holy Ghost does with it is far, far superior to the highest level of what you have learned in the natural. But for a man to allow the natural to die so that the Holy Ghost can resurrect it with superiority is the need. That's why many of you that are intelligent, you come to do God's work with intelligence. It cannot work. So may I say to you that everything that the church needs to grow is in Christ and is available within the church. And I want to tell you, if we were to be submissive to the Holy Spirit and to the divine gifting, what you will be seeing anywhere the child of God is operating will be far superior to the best of what happens in the world system. Superior. So the gifts with which to run the church is where? Is in the church. What we make the church to grow is among the members. They have been endowed. But the first problem is that most of the brothers and sisters in the church have been rendered redundant, useless because we never recognize that they were saved to serve. And that each one of them, as they were being brought out of captivity, as he led captivity captive, he gave gifts unto men. Because that is not clear to us. We are happy to just continue to impress the church, to be operating, to be doing everything. Few people are acting. All others are watching. They may clap hands. They may shout and admire you and say, yes. And some of you think that is great. That's not true. It's not good. God is looking for the body where every member is particularly functional. And every member is doing something within their own grace space to bring profit to the rest of us. Can God do that for us in our local churches? So that takes us to the next issue. The next issue, let's read Ephesians 4, 11, 12. 11 and 12. Yes. Yes, the prophets. The evangelists. Uh-huh. Yes. Okay. Why is it that he gives us these special abilities? Yes. Uh huh. It is that God's people will be equipped. So. Let's wait there. Let's read NIV now. NIV 4, I mean 4, 11, and 12. It was he who gave some to be apostles. Uh-huh. Some to be prophets. Yes. Some to be evangelists. Yes. And some to be pastors and teachers. And teachers. To prepare God's people for works of service. To prepare God's people for works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up. You see, 
everyone has grace. He has given every one of them gifts with which to profit the body. Is that okay? But each of them have these gifts that is lying fallow. That is lying untapped and unconnected. Are you understanding? Many of your people, they have gifts, but not connected. Not, not, not tapped. Not focused. Not tailored. Are you understanding? So why does God now decide to now raise leaders? What we call ministry gifts. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Why? It is not so that they can be prominent. Mm -mm. It is not that they can dominate the ministry. Why did he set them up? So that they can do what? Equip and ignite. And release the, the intrinsic gifts that is lying dormant in the people to release it so that it can break forth. Are, are, are you understanding that now? So all that the pastor, the evangelist, the teacher, the prophet, even the apostles was raised to do in the body of Christ. It's not so that they can become big men. Apostle, prophet. No. They were called to do just one thing. To do what? To equip the saints. To release the saints. To get the people to be doing what they are born and endowed by God to do. And if they have started doing that, for them to fade out, you will see how that their ministry is not forever. If you look at verse 13, you will see one word. You may omit it, but it's a very important word. Until did you see the word until? You see, some of you want to be pastors forever over the same church. You want to have them as your permanent members, crippled that can go nowhere. And your mind is saying, yes, they are my members. No, you don't understand. If you understand so well, you will know that God gives them to you and gave you to them to equip them until they have come to the full stature. Your ministry in the life of people is time, time limited. God actually is not expecting that they will be your rabbit forever. God is not expecting that all the people that he has put under you at a time, they will remain babies. That every Sunday they are looking to you and say, Pastor, pray for us. Pastor, pray for us. When will they be able to pray for themselves? You don't know that such kind of ministry also ties you down. It doesn't allow you yourself to grow. Which one of you 
have delivered a child and you would like to breastfeed that child for 12 years. Eh? How many of you are happy that you have a child and 12 years you are still tying napkin for him? And anytime he wants to go to the toilet, he says, Mama, Mama, I want to pee. And then he says, Okay, come, let me open your nappy for you. After 12 years, are you happy for that? But unfortunately, many pastors, they enjoy that kind of children. In fact, they think that is what makes them a great pastor. It's because you don't recognize that God actually set time until listen, it is not that your own ministry will finish. The truth of the matter is that as they are getting full, you are setting them aside and taking an empty vessel. That's what will not allow your anointing to stagnate. What will make you fresh is that you are having people that are sucking fresh from you. That's what makes you fresh. But as long as it is the same old baby <laughs> who is no more hungry. Are you understanding that now? Even your messages will begin to be dead. Imagine that you are pastoring a group of people for 12 years. You have known all of them. You know all their problems. Are you understanding? You know those who have marital problems. You know everything about them. Do you know that your, your word of knowledge will die? You don't need word of knowledge where you know everybody. Oh Lord, you are not understanding me. You see, you cannot be prophesying to people whom you know everything about them. So when you say, thus says the Lord, there is a woman here whose son has left home since three years. But that issue you have discussed. The woman said, which woman? Is it not my son that he is prophesying about? That is what kills a pastor. That's what kills your ministry. It is that lack of understanding that you've got to be laboring on lives looking forward that they will be released to continue the work of the Christian service. And as you are doing that, God is happy to release new sets of men to you. For you to build them again. For you to pour into them again. And for them to take their place. You equip and release them. They are not lost. They are also laboring for the building. So you see the church is growing. But the growth of the church is not because of you alone. It's because you have done your own to this set of men and they have been released and they are now effectively doing what they are supposed to do. So many people will be coming to the church and it's not because of you. Some of you are not happy when people came to the work and they are giving their testimony and it's not because the pastor preached. You feel that the other man is already starting his ministry. No. You've made a mistake. The truth is that that brother should be the reason why someone else has come to the work. It has not discredited you because it only meant that what you did in his life is working. Hallelujah. So when you are eating here, you know you are not eating for yourself now. You are eating all 
also for the people that will suck from your life. That's how the church should be built. But not understanding biblical principles. Some of you want to be forever coordinators. Nobody should talk unless they came through you. Yes, you know, that kind of principle is a worldly, administrative, hierarchical principle. It's not church. That's not how the body of Christ is. You see, as soon as God gives you people, you must link them with the head. That's what makes them functional in the body. Do you know that every organ in your body here has a, a link with your brain here? And all the veins, all the nerves that services every organ are distinct up here. Each one of them has connection. So to build the body of Christ, the first thing is for you to know that God just brought you in as a helper to raise people, to equip them, to send them. I said, you are not going to be the preacher of all the messages. If you are a Bible teacher, do you know what God wants you to do? He wants you to begin to equip others that are sitting down there undeveloped, unequipped but with grace that is dormant equip them and release them don't worry that they will teach and they are not perfect you didn't start perfectly God was patient with you why can't you be patient with others you made many mistakes. God did not chop your head. Why do you go and chop somebody's head because he made a mistake? And that's the problem. Those of you that feel you are, you are perfectionist, nobody does things well in your eyes. So, the people are rendered impotent because they won't do it according to your tastes. You don't, and you don't know that you are a limited man. You are limited. No matter how wonderful you can do things, you cannot be in two places at the same time. You are not omnipresent. <clears throat> because you are not omnipresent, you must understand that in the plan and purposes of God for church to grow, you've got to release, equip, leave people behind so that you can move on within the space of your grace. This has been Living Seed. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers... 0703 0366359 0703 768119 Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Make it a date with us next week.